these are great. What's your name? Thank you. My name is Beth Ann Parker. <laughs> they're just so creative. Yeah, so they're a pool actually from a lot of visual memories. I'm bringing in a lot of family narratives, domestic narratives, as well as um, historical and my own personal memory and experiences into them. They look like they were fun to paint. Very fun. And it completely a submission to my own instincts, which is really a joy to do. Uh, so, absolutely free. Freeing a nation. I love this. So, okay. It was nice so to nice to meet you. You'll be Thank in a movie. You. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Beth Ann Parker. I'm having my first solo show here at Gross McLeaf Almanac. It was wonderful to see Beth Ann Parker again after two years. She told me that she and her family had arrived at the gallery after a two and a half hour drive, which begged the question, where do you live? The Poconos Mountains, Northeast Appalachia. It's beautiful there. I was told that the Parker family is trying to live off the grid. So how does Beth Ann translate her life into her art? There's something of a conjuring that needs to happen every day. And it's almost a rebellion at the same token. So to be able to do those everyday practices and then embed those into the paintings as well is kind of a full appreciation and gratitude for my environment. Who's the brains behind the moving off the grid? <laughs> I may have instigated that situation, but uh, she's gone along with it. But uh, ultimately, yeah, if we could sustainably farm and live off grid, that'd be, that'd be pretty amazing. Yeah. Okay. Chickens, rabbits, and a kraken. <laughs> a kraken? What's a kraken? Our bird. Oh! In early works as a PAFA student, Beth Ann painted on top of found artworks, creating dual realities within a single piece. And I was really curious about the mind's potential to create an image through thoughts, dreams, and visions. When you were at school, all these things were happening and defund the police. I think that was just about to happen. But your work is not as political as many of your peers. When I was working with found materials, it did take on more political notes. Beth Ann painted over a year's worth of New York Times front pages and made an installation of it. This work is actually a bridge off of that, getting to a purer image of what is in myself through memory and dreams. And this is what naturally came out. What I'm trying to really do is get into the feelings of the interior and exterior. And the work comes off of motifs from my country living, from everything from birth, death, resurrection, and redemption that you see internally and throughout the countryside as well. Your paintings capture the beauty of the landscape, but they also seem quite spiritual. Definitely consider myself a searcher. I'm a Christian as well. And whenever I look into the land, what I'm trying to do is feel the rhythms, the tensions, where sky meets land, where valleys dwell low, the sun and the moon, the eclipses. These are all in tune with ourselves, and they're also metaphors of how we experience and move through our own lives. That is certainly where I am trying to find my communion with God. I feel like the work itself is an incantation, is a prayer. When I'm working, everything is in an absolute devotion to what I'm experiencing and perceiving because I feel like that is communion. Artists who inspire Beth Ann, like Charles Birchfield, Samuel Palmer, Florence Stettenheimer, and William Blake are also seekers. All of these artists have their finger on the thread. 
That's the place of tension and investigation that I'd like to dwell. I assume that you, like St. Francis, believe in good stewardship of the natural world. What are your thoughts about the climate change disaster? We need to take action right now towards it. The environment and the world around me is so prominent in every single activity and every single ritual and practice every day. I see that's where the fusion becomes with the homesteading, with the creative practice and with God as well. They're all tied together, they're all one. And if we lose focus on one or especially mistreat it and even destroy it, it will all become out of balance. So. your crack and, and what is he or she like? So my bird is the kraken, probably because she eats the walls, destroys my bed, and bites. Does your mom ever paint the kraken? I don't really think so, but I sketch her a lot. Uh, maybe if you have email, maybe your mom could send me a drawing, I'll put it in the movie. Sure. So, yeah. Yeah. One thing that I find so extraordinary about your work is that you have pretty much invented your own visual language. It's a language that the viewer does have some purchase on. You can understand what's going on. But it may take a while to decipher, oh, there's a sheep, there's a person. Does that bother you? No, I think that's actually wonderful. I I like to think of it as using the same format as a linguistic metaphor. With a metaphor or a parable, you're given two things that you recognize, perhaps a person and a sheep, but everything between is abstract. You have to enter it with your own experiences and your own personal observations to understand what the story is for you. I think of the paintings in the same way. I would hope that those recognizable things give you points of interest, and then you're able to create a bridge through your own personal experiences, taking on the painting, bringing it to life for your own self. I'm an identical twin. I see two embryonic identical twins in the womb connected by an umbilical cord, but that is probably not intended. That's fantastic. What you bring to it is absolutely what it is. I would hope for every person that they can bring their own. But you're not the mother of identical twins. I'm not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just buy it? I did. I see two people who are estranged. They're looking the opposite way. And on one side of the painting, there's offerings, there's flowers, there may be a drink, there are humans. On the other side, it's a deep, deep forest. And we don't know what's going to happen. The middle could be a tunnel. It could be a vagina. It could be anything, but it's an opening. And if one of them gets swallowed up, we don't know what's going to happen to them. Polarity happens a lot in my work, so perhaps that's a little bit of it, because I feel like for a complete, there's always two halves. Can you explain what you mean by polarity? Two things coming together, day and night, good and bad, that may be seen with attention, but need to exist simultaneously for anything to work. A title like Spray Rope for Winter Hope, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> a floral spray is something that you would offer someone at a funeral in memory of them. You have the polarities of the seasons, winter and spring, coming together in collision. Winter holds a time that has been buried, but the spray, which is usually a big fan, has instead been transformed into a rope to be able to come out then of the grave and receive spring, which is close in hand in the background.
and there's one assumption before the rise, which looks like someone in a bed, and perhaps the soul is four feet above the body. That's off of the assumption of Mary. It's a self-portrait, actually. She'll come back. I'll come back. We all come back. How many times does one die in their life? We do carry within ourselves, with every whole being, that union of two. And it's constantly being put down and coming back. I love transit times. Is it a little dog chasing a train? It's so charming and wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So that was inspired off of Benton's The Race, if you're familiar with that painting. It's a horse racing a train in relation to the race against industrialism. And so that's what inspired this painting here. And yes, it's a dog racing against the springtime. As you can see, there is a blockage in the way and the tensions still rise between who's going to win that race. <laughs> it's fascinating how you create your paintings from a technical standpoint. There's oil paint, bare linen, maybe rabbit skin glue. I was joking that maybe you shot the rabbit and made your own glue. I don't know if that's true. Yes. Oh, oh, what? what? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I am greatly <laughs> interested in traditional materials and how they can be bent in different ways. While I was at PAFA, I started making my own glues, my own paints. I thought it was very important to bridge my creative practice and my rural lifestead. So I raise rabbits. We're hunters. You hunt what? Bunnies. And what do you do with them? We feed them and then we tan the hide. Oh, okay. I would take our venison hides and dry them out, cook them down, grind them, make glues. So on a lot of these paintings, there's venison hide glue and also rabbit skin as well. But also pigments. I like to grind in walnut ink. We harvest all of our own wood, make lye solutions for panning and the dry hide process, charcoal as well. So I use that to draw with. Do you use thread as an art material? And are you inspired by any kind of needlework? I grew up in a house that had folk, Quaker and Shaker paintings and artwork throughout. And my mother used to do a lot of embroidery work. So that's really kind of in the foreground of a lot of my visual memory. The painting, it's so impasto. And I like for the linen itself to shine through painting on the linen. It almost gives the embroidered look. I was curious about, well, what if we combine these? Can we blur the line where you see thread and paint and not notice it? It's something I'm still investigating, as well as fiber harvesting, too, from rabbits that we have. Tell me about the title to your show. Almanacs look both forward and backward in time, backward in traditions and at the stars and moons and sunspots to then look forward towards future trends and forecasts. And I felt like it was perfect as far as my painting practice goes because so often I look back not only in art traditions but also in my own past and try to bridge these things together in some type of subconscious wanderings to look then forward. When I work, I'm almost being submissive to it. I don't judge the work and I try not to think too much, but instead fully give myself to the feeling. And then when I can step back and analyze the work, I see it as a forecast. And I can then anticipate events that are going to happen within my life or the community itself. And I've found them to be fairly accurate. I'm not going to ask you how many more years I have because I'm <laughs> afraid to find out. But anyway, Beth Ann, it was so nice to see you again. I truly love your work. Oh, thank you so much. And I love yours too. <laughs> Absolutely. I admire all of your videos and watch them. Thanks. Does this make you guys want to move to the Poconos and live yes, on a farm? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs>